What's up everybody? It's Travis here from Travis.media. After today's video, you are finally going to understand basic AWS networking. I guarantee it because I'm going to explain it all to you. But before we get started, let me give you a short backstory. About three years ago, I switched over in my job to a site reliability engineer. And I got put on a team of like 30 people, most of whom were not primarily programmers in their previous careers. We had system admins, we had network admins, we had cloud architects. We even had one guy that worked at Dell like 20 years ago. All of these guys and girls were like way over my head in experience. And I immediately got thrown into the cloud with everybody and everybody understood it and they were architecting and doing all these diagrams and planning all this stuff. And I didn't know what I was doing because I was primarily a programmer. And I eventually came up to speed within a couple of months. But looking back, I see that my biggest struggle was networking. As programmers, we don't have to do a lot of networking. We write code and we build apps, but we don't have to understand VPCs and subnets and route tables and gateways and all of those things. So I decided to make a video for programmers. If you're one of those people who wants to get into the cloud or is looking to move up to a senior level and need to learn these networking basics, then this video is going to be for you. So in today's video, I'm going to teach you basic networking and I'm going to use AWS as our example, and I'm going to do it practically. It's not going to be a theory. It's not going to be PowerPoint. So we're going to look at the architectural diagram of what we're building. We're going to step through that. We're going to look at terminology, what each of these terms mean, like VPCs, subnets, route tables, NAT gateways. And then we're going to go in AWS and build this out practically and see these things in action. And we're going to cover a lot of neat topics like site arranges. And you'll even see my quirky way of explaining it. So go make you a pot of coffee, sign into AWS, and let's get started. And as always, if you find this helpful, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. Let's go. All right, so here's our final diagram of what we're building. So we have a VPC and we have all of these components within it. So if I get rid of all this and bring us to the starting point, we just have the AWS cloud. So if you go and log into AWS, you'll be all caught up with me. Now within AWS, you have things called VPCs. So a VPC or a virtual private cloud works like a private network to isolate the resources within it. So a VPC is like a fence around a bunch of resources. It separates all of your resources within it from another VPC with all of its resources in it. So let's add that to our diagram. Now we have a VPC. But like I said, this is not a theoretical video. This is practical. So let's go and create one in AWS. So to do that, just go up here to search, type in VPC and click on VPC. All right, then select VPCs. So here you see we have our default VPC and that's it. So let's create a new one so that we can build out all of our components. So click on create VPC. And you can now do VPC and more, which gives you a VPC, gives you four subnets, three route tables and two network connections. We're actually not going to do this. Once you go through this video and you understand all of these services or all of these pieces, then you can go and do this quick start. But until then, let's do it manually. So click VPC only. Name tag, I'm just going to call it my new VPC. And next you have an IPv4 CIDR block. So what CIDR range is this VPC going to fall within? Now, this was a big thing for me, a big hurdle for me when I started out, like what is a CIDR range, right? And what is this slash 24 and why am I doing that? So let me give you a quick rundown, like a, like a dummy's guide to this. So the way I like to look at it is if I do what they have here, they have suggested 10.0.0.0 slash 24. So here's the way I explain this and it's not going to be conventional and people are going to give me a hard time, but let me tell you, you'll remember it after this. So each one of these numbers is called an octet and each one represents eight bits. And I actually wrote an article here on Medium explaining it, but basically each one of these is eight bits. And if you add them all up, that's 32 bits. So the way I do it is if you see a slash 24, this means the first one being eight, second one being 16 and the third one being 24. This only lets you change the IP range on the last number. If you have 10.0.0.0 slash 16, you start at the beginning. So this is eight, this is 16, and those are locked. You can only change the numbers or the ranges on the last two numbers. And of course, if you have 10.0.0.0 slash eight, that means you can change the numbers on the last three octets. Hopefully that makes sense. That's the way I remember it. It's not technical, but it really helps me out. And I think I have the numbers here that might help you out a little better. 
So if I paste this in, so slash 24, if you see here, that's the IP address is 10.0.0.1 through 10.0.0.254. See how we're only able to change the last one? We have one through 254. The 10.0.0, don't change. When we got the 16, we got 10.0.0.1 through 10.0.255.254. So you can't change these first two or 16. So anyway, I think if you remember that, you won't have any problem with this going forward. You can't explain it technically to people who are like purists, but we're not trying to do that. We're trying to be practical and understand things in our own way. And I think that'll be helpful for you. So what I want to do here is I don't want this 24. I actually want to do 10.0.0.0 slash 16. So that means these first two numbers are locked. I can only change the ranges in the last two numbers. That's where I want to start this. That gives me a lot more IP addresses than a slash 24. And if you look this up, um, IP range, IP subnet calculator, we're going to get to subnets in a minute. But if I just type this in 10.0.0.0, and then I change this to 16, you'll see we have tons of IP addresses. Calculate, and you have 65,500 and something IP addresses you can play with because we have 10.0.0.1 through 10.0.255.254. And we'll use this in a minute when we get to subnets, but, but remember my dumbed down version and you'll do well. So let's set that IP cider. Let's leave Tennessee default. I don't need any tags. It sets one automatically, but I'm just going to click create VPC to create it. And now you have a VPC with this cider range. So if we go back to our diagram, we're good to go there. Now within a VPC, you have these isolated networks in these different cider ranges called subnets. And the terminology is this. A subnet is a defined set of network IP addresses that are used to increase the security and efficiency of network communications. You can think of them like postal codes used for routing packages from one location to another. So anyway, they're just these defined set of IP ranges. And what you normally see here is a public subnet and a private subnet. So you have a public subnet for all of your public applications and a private subnet for things that you don't want to be public. So let's add that to our diagram first to see what we're doing. So we're going to be creating a private subnet and a public subnet, two subnets. So let's go back, make sure you're in the VPC dashboard and click on subnets. And we have all these default subnets. We don't have to worry about those, but go up here and click create subnet. Select your VPC ID. This puts your subnets within that VPC. So I'm going to select my new VPC, the one we just created and subnet settings. So subnet name, let's do public subnet. Now availability zone, what you normally see people do is they create two public subnets and two private subnets, one being in different availability zones. So you'll make a public subnet in this availability zone and another public subnet in this availability zone. You'll do the same for private. You'll put one here and one here. That way, if an availability zone goes down, you have high availability by having another availability zone available to serve your applications. But we're not going to do that today because we're keeping this basic. So we're just going to do one public and one private. So this is going to be a public subnet. I'm just going to choose US East 1A. All right, now IPv4 CIDR block. What are we going to do here? Well, it has to be within this CIDR range, 10.000 slash 16. We're going to make it easy. A lot of the times people want lots of private and not as many public because not as many things are going to be public for this demonstration. It doesn't matter. So let's do, let's do what it gives us here. 10.0.0.0 slash 24. That means we'll only be able to take this from one to 256, this last octet. And that's our public subnet. Let's go ahead and add a new one. You can click this add new subnet here and let's create the private subnet. So let's do private subnet and availability zone. Doesn't matter. I'm going to choose the first one. In this one, we're going to do 10.0.1.0 slash 24. And that again allows us 254 here. And it's going to be different from the other subnet because this one is 1.0, whereas the other one is 0.0. .0. Hope that makes sense. And so we have our public subnet and our private subnet. So let's click create subnet to create both of those. And one thing about a subnet is you have to have a subnet to launch resources in your VPC. So you can't just do a VPC and then launch an EC2 instance. You have to have a subnet to put resources in. So now that we have a subnet, let's go ahead and launch an EC2 instance. And we're going to launch it in the public subnet. So let's go to our diagram, go to the next step here, which is going to be our EC2 instance. So we're going to launch an EC2 instance into our public subnet. So we have a VPC, we have a public and a private subnet, and we're going to launch an EC2 instance in our public subnet. 
So I'm gonna come back here and under services, I'm gonna click on EC2 and open a new tab. And I'm gonna click launch instance to launch a new one. I'm gonna call it my public instance. And I'm gonna leave it Amazon Linux. Instance type, I'm gonna choose a T2 micro because it's in the free tier. Key pair, I'm gonna choose a key pair. Make sure you create one if you don't have one, create a new key pair. I'm gonna choose the one I have. And for my network settings, click on edit, change this to your VPC, my new VPC, and then your public subnet. Like I said, you have to launch resources into subnets. Auto assign public IP, enable. We want a public IP, this is a public EC2 instance. And then create a security group. I'll call it SG public. And then security group rules. We're gonna get to security groups in a little bit, but this rule allows me to SSH from anywhere into my instance. So TCP protocol, port range 22, source type anywhere. I should be able to SSH into this. After you're done with that, click launch instance to launch it. And while that's launching, uh, regarding security groups, a security group acts as a virtual firewall for your EC2 instances to control incoming and outgoing traffic. So security groups are related to EC2 instances. And as you recall, we set a rule there to allow incoming SSH traffic. But again, we'll get to that in a few. So my instance is running. Let me click on it and go to connect. And I'll go to EC2 instance connect and click connect to connect to the instance. Do you think this will work? It will not work. We get a message here that says, EC2 instance connect is unable to connect to your instance. Why? Because we don't have any way out to the internet. We just created a subnet. We called it public subnet. That doesn't make it public. We're still completely isolated in our VPC. So to allow internet access to our subnets, we need something called a gateway. That's our next item here. So let me click this. And more specifically, we need an internet gateway. But let's talk about a gateway for a minute. A gateway in general connects your VPC to another network. So you have your VPC here. A gateway just connects it to another network. For example, we're gonna use an internet gateway to connect your VPC to the internet. But then there are transit gateways, there are NAT gateways, which we're gonna see in a minute. But just remember that, a gateway, it just connects your VPC to another network. We're gonna be using an internet gateway, as you see on the diagram here, that's gonna allow our subnets out to the internet. So let's set that up. So go back to VPC and you'll see here on the left, um, internet gateways. Yeah, right here, internet gateways. We need to create a new one. No internet gateways found in this region. Let's create one. And you can only have one per VPC, I believe. And let's call it, like it says here, my internet gateway. And create internet gateway. It's really that easy. And now we have our internet gateway, but you see a message up here. The following gateway was created you can now attach to a VPC to enable the VPC to communicate with the internet. So we have an internet gateway, but it's detached. It's not attached to any VPC, it's not doing anything. So let's attach it to our VPC. So go to actions, click attach to VPC, and click your VPC and attach internet gateway. Again, just go to actions and attach. Here you can detach if you want, but we attached our internet gateway to our VPC. All right, so let's go back to connect to an instance. Click on connect and see if we can connect. And it still doesn't work. I mean, we created the gateway, why are things not working? Well, because we have to give our subnet a route to the internet gateway. And we can do this with something called route tables. So let's pull up our diagram. And let me add that, route tables. So right here you see a route table. We need to alter this route table on our public subnet to allow a route out to the internet gateway. And don't mind this router here, that's what this symbol is. Every VPC has a router, you don't have to worry about it, it's already there. So we need to alter this subnet to go out to the internet gateway. You see this arrow here going back and forth between the subnets? The route tables already allow that private traffic, we just need to create a rule to go out to the internet gateway. So let's do that. Let's go back to VPC management and go to route tables. Now you'll see here that your VPC already comes with a default route table. That's what this is. And it's called the main route table. See right here, it says main, yes. All unassociated subnets use this. So if you go to this main route table, you look at routes, we only have one route and it's the local traffic. So all the traffic within the VPC. That's why we had this arrow going right here. There's already, this is already allowed in the route, route table. Now, subnet associations, any subnets that don't have explicit associations default to the main route table. So this private public subnet by default use this default main route table. 
So what we want to do is we want to create a route table for our public subnet and for our private subnet. We don't want to use this default because we don't want to treat them the same. We want to have them explicitly different and it's just good practice to do that. So let's create a route table called a uh, public route table. Create route table. Oops, I got to choose a VPC. Make sure you choose your VPC. This route table will be associated with it. And let's create another one called private route table. And associate it with your VPC. And let's go back to route tables. So now we have our main route table, but we also have two more created called public and private. Public and private have nothing to do. They haven't been associated with any subnets. They're just created. What we want to do is we want to go to public route table and we want to associate it with our public subnet so that we can control what's going on there. So let's edit subnet associations and we're going to choose public subnet and associate it with this route table. So the route table belongs to the VPC and we associate subnets to route tables. So we associated that subnet, the public subnet with our public route table. And we're going to do the same for private. So here's private route table. We're going to go to subnet associations, edit, and associate the private subnet with the private route table. And now if you look at our default or main route table, you'll see that we have no subnet associations. They're now associated with other route tables, ones that we created explicitly. So we have this public subnet route table. How do we get it to route to the internet gateway? Well, it's very easy. We just go to our public route table, click routes, and then click edit routes, click add route. And for destination, we want to choose everything. So the 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, that's all IP addresses. And this covers all IP addresses outside of this VPC side arranged. So all of these IP addresses in this VPC can talk to each other. Subnets can talk to subnets, no problem. But everything else, the public internet, all the IP addresses out there, we want to make this wide open. And our target is going to be the internet gateway, which we can choose here. Once we've done that, click Save Changes. And you'll see that now our public route table has a destination out to the internet gateway. So now if we try to connect to our EC2 instance via SSH, we should be able to because we have a security group rule that allows us to SSH into this and our instance is now available out on the public internet. So click this, go to connect and EC2 instance connect. And let's see if we can do it. There we go. So now we have public access to our EC2 instance over the internet. So we can do something like sudo yum update dash Y to update our packages and everything works fine. Great. So let's go back to our diagram. So now we have a route out to the internet. So out to our internet gateway, out to the internet. Let's include that. So what do we want to do next? Well, let's launch an EC2 instance into our private subnet and learn about NAT gateways. So go to EC2 instances and launch instances. And we're going to call this my private instance. And we're going to choose Amazon Linux, T2 Micro, my key pair. And network settings is going to be my uh, VPC. And the subnet is going to be this time my private subnet. And we don't need a public IP because it's private. And let's create a new security group called SG Private. And that looks good. Uh, we have an SSH rule. That's fine. Let's do that. Uh, it's not open to the internet, so nobody can do that, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So launch your instance. So we do have a security group on our private instance that allows SSH access. So let's try to SSH into our private instance from our public instance. We should be able to do that, right? And to do that, we need to upload our key. Remember to SSH, we have to create a key pair. We need to upload our key that's on our computer up here to this server so that when we SSH into the private server, we have that key to use. And that's pretty easy to do. So I have an SCP command. If you're not familiar, you can just Google it. This allows you to upload a file from your local computer onto a server with one command. So it allows you to log in, upload all in one command. So what this does is sudo SCP dash I is a flag that indicates this is your key that you're using to access that public instance, air public instance. And then the file that you want to copy up there is going to be the key pair. And you want to copy it to your 
public server. This is my IP address. It's going to be the EC2 user at this public IP address. And then the location that I'm copying it to is a home slash EC2 user. So I'm going to grab this. Again, this is just copying our key pair up to that server so that we can access our private server. So I'm going to open my local terminal and just run this command and put in my password for sudo. And it copied it. So now on my public instance here, I should have it, ls, there's my tm aws key pair dot pim. Now from this public address, I want to try to SSH into my private server. So let me get my private server IP address. Here it is. I mean, the route tables allow subnet to subnet access. So this should in theory work. So let's do SSH dash I and my key pair, which is in the same directory. And then EC2 user at that IP address. And type yes, and it worked. So everything's working fine. We can access our private server from our public server. And that worked fine. We can't go directly to our private server. We can't access that from outside of the VPC, but we can access the public server and from there, SSH into the private server. So that works fine. And now that we've SSH'd into our private server, let's try to do something like updating our yum packages. So sudo yum update dash y. And you'll see that it's not gonna do anything. Why? Because we don't have access to the internet. And you might think, hey, that's the point. We're in a private subnet. We don't want access to the internet. And that's true, but how do we update our packages? Is there a way that we can reach out to the internet, but nobody can reach in to where we're at? Well, there is. There's something called a NAT gateway. So a NAT gateway is a network address translation service. You can use a NAT gateway so that instances in a private subnet can connect to services outside your VPC, but external services cannot initiate a connection with those instances. So I can reach out and I can update my packages, but nothing outside the VPC can come in and access that server. That's pretty neat. So how do you set something like this up? Well, first you create a NAT gateway and you actually wanna do it in the public subnet. So let's click on NAT gateway here to reveal what we're gonna do. You're gonna create the NAT gateway in a public subnet because this public subnet has a route out to the internet. And then you're gonna use your private route table to route out to that NAT gateway. So this NAT gateway is gonna allow our private subnet to reach out to the internet and do things, while at the same time allowing nothing outside of the VPC to come into our private subnet and access that directly. And actually we want to add our private EC2 here. So this EC2 instance, by way of this route table, can reach out to the NAT gateway in the public subnet and use the internet. So let's create that. If you go to subnets and NAT gateway, click on create NAT gateway, and let's create one. So let's call it my NAT gateway. Uh, subnet, I wanna put it in the, in the public subnet. Connectivity type is public, and we need to allocate an elastic IP. Just click that button to do so. And click Create NAT Gateway. And I think this takes a couple minutes to actually get into a running state. So I'm gonna pause this and come right back when this is running. And actually, while this is initiating, we can go ahead to our route tables and our private route table and add a route out to our NAT Gateway. So Edit Routes and add a route, we're gonna do everything. And then the target is gonna be a NAT gateway. It's gonna be this one that's still creating. It's not gonna work yet, but we can go ahead and set this up. So edit routes and save changes. And it's creating a route. And you'll see here in our private route table, we now have a route out to our NAT gateway. So let's go back to that. And again, I'll come back when it's running. All right, so our NAT gateway is available. We've already set the route. So now let's try again and see if we can update our yum packages. So try again, and there we go. So that's working, but if I were to get my uh, private IP address, this private address, of course, is not gonna work if I try to SSH into that. So a NAT gateway allows you, again, to let your private instances reach out to the internet to update or upgrade whatever you need to do, but nothing to access them back. So looking at our diagram, we've done a lot. We've created the VPC, we've created the subnets, the EC2 instances, the route out to the internet, and the route over to a NAT gateway to allow our private subnet the ability to use that to grab 
things off the internet. And I think that's a lot. I do have one more thing I want to tackle, but I want to kind of leave you guys with that today. I think that's a lot to take in. And if you understand this much, you've understood a lot. We don't need to get into transit gateways and VPC peering yet. Take this information, let it soak in. But there's one more thing that we need to talk about, and that is knackles and security groups. So I'm going to enable this last piece of the diagram and talk about these. So knackles, network access control lists. A network access control list is like a virtual firewall that protects the subnet. So it's another layer of protection around the subnet. And this network access control list is stateless. So if you allow something into the subnet, it doesn't remember that state and then allow it back out. You allow it in, you have to have also an outbound rule to allow it back out of the subnet. So that's a network access control list or a knackle as people call them. It's a virtual firewall for the entire subnet. And the reason why I'm not going to get into it is because most people leave that default. And the default is that it allows everything in and allows everything out. And most people don't need to change that because you have routes and you have security groups and things like that. One, one use case people do use them for is to block an IP address at the subnet level. That's a good use case for it. But normally, you just leave the default. And it's kind of an added layer of protection for your subnet if you need it. Now, your NACL protects your subnet, but once you get through that, you have something called a security group. And a security group is like a virtual firewall that protects your EC2 instance. So every EC2 instance gets associated with a security group, and the security group protects the EC2 instance. Now, the security group, unlike the NACL, is stateful. If there's an inbound rule and some data comes in, it's going to remember that state and also allow that same rule out. So the knackle is stateless. If you allow it in, you also have to set a rule to allow it back out. A security group, when you allow something in, it's going to automatically allow that back out. It's going to remember the state. And this is where I stop today. Again, like I said, it's a lot to take in. But if you understand these basic concepts, I think you'll do well. And if you enjoyed this and you want to see like a more advanced version of this, where we do get into transit gateways and peering and things like that, then let me know down in the comments and I'll get that made in the future. Hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one.